I'm going to take a little bit of time now to talk about anatomy and physiology and just give you a quick review of the anatomy and physiology of the heart. And so when you're thinking about the heart as a structure, remember that it is a fist size muscular organ. It is located in the mediastinum between the lungs. Um, each beat of the heart pumps about 60 mL of blood or about 5 liters per minute. Obviously during strenuous activity that is going to increase. When you think about the different areas or you think about the anatomy of the heart, um, remember that blood travels a specific route through the heart. Uh, the right atrium receives deoxygenated uh, venous blood, which is returned from the body through the superior and inferior vena cava. It also receives blood from the heart muscle through the coronary sinus. Uh, most of the, the venous return flows passively from the right atrium through the open tricuspid valve and to the right ventricle during ventricular diastole or filling. The remaining venous return is actively propelled by the right atrium into the right ventricle during atrial systole or contraction. So you do need to understand the difference between uh, ventricular diastole and atrial systole. Uh, the right ventricle is a muscular pump located behind the sternum. It generates enough pressure to close the tricuspid valve and open the pulmonon pulmonic valve and then um, force blood into the pulmonary artery and lungs. Uh, after that blood is reoxygenated in the blood, it flows uh, freely from the four pulmonary veins into the left atrium. After the, entering the left atrium, the blood flows through an open mitral valve into the left ventricle during ventricular diastole. When the left ventricle is almost full, the left atrium contracts, pumping the remaining blood volume into the left ventricle. Uh, with systolic contraction, the left ventricle generates enough pressure to close that mitral valve and open the aortic valve. And then blood will flow through the aorta and into systemic arterial circulation. So you do need to have a good understanding of how blood travels through the heart. And so this picture can be found in figure 35-2 talking about the blood flow through the heart. So if you take a few moments, write all that down um, and have a good understanding of that uh, prior to coming into class, that will help uh, get you through uh, the first portion of lecture. We need to talk about the four cardiac valves, the tricuspid, mitral, pulmonic, and aortic valves. Um, the AV valve separates the atria from the ventricles. So the tricuspid valve separates the right atrium from the right ventricle and the mitral or bicuspid valve uh, separates the left atrium from the left ventricle. So during ventricular diastole uh, these valves act as funnels and help move the flow of blood from the atria to the ventricles and then during systole the valves close to prevent backflow or regurgitation back into the atria. Um, the pul pulmonic valve separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary artery and then the aortic valve separates the left ventricle from the aorta. The heart muscle receives blood uh, to meet its metabolic needs through the coronary arterial system. And if you look in your book on um, figure 35-3, it does um, give you a list and shows you a pictorial view of the coronary arterial system. Uh, the coronary arteries originate from an area on the aorta just um, beyond the aortic valve. All of the coronary arteries um, feeding the left heart originate from the left main coronary artery and then the right coronary artery branches from the aorta to perfuse the right heart and inferior wall of the left heart. When you're thinking about coronary artery blood flow, um, you need to consider that, it, you know, the idea behind that is to maintain adequate blood flow through the coronary arteries. And so when you talk about blood flow through the coronary arteries, it's considered the mean arterial pressure. And with the mean arterial pressure, it must be at least 60 millimeters of mercury. Um, so anywhere between 60 and 70 is what you want to see as being normal and what is necessary to maintain perfusion of the major body organs, so your kidneys, your brain, uh, those types of things. So continuing on with the 
coronary blood flow, the left main artery divides into two branches. So you have the left anterior descending or the LAD branch and then the left circumflex branch. Uh, the LAD branch descends towards the anterior wall and the apex of the left ventricle and the left circumflex branch descends toward the lateral wall of the left ventricle and apex. Um, and then lastly, the right coronary artery originates in the right sinus of the Valsalva area. And when you think about the Valsalva area, remember the Valsalva, uh, the Valsalvic maneuver. Um, that encircles the heart and descends towards the apex of the right ventricle. And the right coronary artery supplies the right atrium, the right ventricle, and then the inferior portion of the left ventricle. So um, considering those types of things and blood flow and adequate perfusion, uh, we need to think about the function of the heart and the functionality of the heart as um, as a muscle. When you're looking at the electrophysiologic properties of the heart, um, they're responsible for regulating your heart rate and rhythm. Uh, cardiac muscle cells possess the characteristics of automatic automaticity, so they automatically know when to contract, so they have automaticity, excitability, conductivity, contractility, and then refractor refractoriness. When you think about the sequence of events during a cardiac cycle, there are phases. So when you are looking at this picture, kind of take a minute to think about what happens during diastole, what happens during systole, and then how things return back to um, diastole. Um, typically, the diastole is normally about two thirds of the cardiac cycle and that consists of relaxation and filling of the atria and ventricles and the systole consists of the contraction and emptying of the atria and ventricles. Um, so myocardial contraction results from the release of a large number of calcium ions um, and then those ions diffuse into the myocardial tissue or the myocardial cells. Uh, the electrical and mechanical properties of the cardiac muscle determine the function of the cardiovascular system. So truly a healthy heart can adapt to various um, pathophysiologic conditions. So when you're thinking about a normal healthy heart, we can respond to exercise, we can respond to stress or infection or hemorrhage, and then we're able to maintain adequate blood flow uh, from the heart in, into systemic arterial circulation. So when you think about that, we need to talk about a few terms. So you need to consider cardiac output and cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped from the left ventricle each minute. So cardiac output depends on the relationship between heart rate and stroke volume. And so it's the product of those two variables that you see listed below heart rate, stroke volume. So cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Typically in adults, cardiac output is going to be four to seven liters per minute. Um, cardiac output does have vary re according to body size. Um, when you think about heart rate, that refers to the number of times the ventricles contract each minute. What is the normal heart rate? About 60 to 100 beats per minute. Obviously, we know that it is controlled by the autonomic nervous system, which can ad adjust rapidly uh, when necessary to help regulate that cardiac output. So thinking about the parasympath parasympathetic system to slow the heart rate and the sympathetic system to stimulate the heart rate, your um, fight or flight. Stroke volume is the amount of blood ejected by the left ventricle during each contraction and things that influence stroke volume really the biggest variable is heart rate and then the preload afterload and then contractility so when we think about preload that's going to refer to the degree of myocardial fiber stretch at the end of diastole and just before that contraction so the stretching imposed on the muscle fibers results from the volume contained within the ventricle at the end of diastole. So preload is determined by the amount of blood returning to the heart from both venous system and the pulmonary system. Your afterload is another, effector, another factor that's going to affect stroke volume. And afterload is the pressure or resistance that the ventricles have to overcome to push blood through the semilunar valves and into the peripheral blood vessels. And that amount of resistance is related to arterial blood pressure um, as well as the diameter of blood vessels. 
Um, impedance is a peripheral component of afterload, and it is the pressure that the heart must overcome to open the aortic valve. And the total amount of impedance depends on aortic compliance and total system vascular resistance. So with that, like how thick is the blood, how constricted are the arter arterioles. And then lastly listed out is myocardial contractility, and that is going to affect stroke volume as well as cardiac output. And myocardial contractility is the force of cardiac contractions. Contractility is increased by things such as sympathetic stimulation from calcium release and is decreased by things like hypoxia and acidemia. So again, just looking um, at this and you're considering properties of the heart, your cardiac index is going to be cardiac output divided by body surface area. And a normal cardiac index is then 2.7 to 3.2. Just a little repeat of what we've talked about, talking about cardiac output. And when you're considering the arterial system, um, the primary function of the arterial system is to deliver the oxygen and nutrients to various tissues in the bodies. So arterial system, blood pressure is going to be very important and blood pressure is the force of blood exerted against the vessel walls. And so when you're considering blood pressure, we talk about a normal blood pressure being about 120 over 80. So there are three mechanisms that mediate and regulate blood pressure. So your autonomic nervous system, the renal system and the kidneys are going to be responsible for a sense of, uh, a change in blood flow and then they're going to be responsible for activating the renin angiotensin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism and the endocrine system helps re er, releases various hormones so catecholamines um, serotonin histamine and stimulate the sympathetic nervous system at that tissue level Other things to consider, um, external factors that are going to affect blood pressure. Uh, so, you know, what kind of activity are you doing? Um, different, different things like that. So when you're talking about baroreceptors, uh, those are going to be located in the arch of the aorta and at the origin of the internal carotid arteries. And they become stimulated when the arterial walls are stretched by an elevated blood pressure. And impulses from the baroreceptors inhibit the vasomotor center, which is located in the pons and the medulla, or the inhibition center. And that's going to help decrease blood pressure. And then the chemoreceptors are sensitive primarily to hypoxia or a decrease in the arterial oxygen. And with the chemoreceptors, what they do is they stimulate and send impulses along the vagus nerve to activate a, vago, a vasoconstriction response, and then those are going to be responsible for raising blood pressure. And as far as A&P, there's a little bit left on the venous system. Um, to just basically complete the um, circulation of body by returning the deoxygenated blood uh, back to the heart and then have it become reoxygenated and full of nutrients. We'll stop here and come to class, be, pre be prepared, ready to discuss uh, the AMP of the heart.